Welcome to the Sports Card Lessons Podcast. I'm your host, Big Ken. Whether you're watching on YouTube or listening on a streaming service, please like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. You'll be notified whenever I drop any new content. Welcome, and thanks for being here. Uh, this week is a collaboration episode with uh, Sports Card Therapist, my first time back in a couple of weeks. I just want to thank everybody for, uh, you know, everyone for that that reached out, um, keeping me in their prayers these last last few weeks uh, with the passing of my mother. Um, I really appreciate it. It just uh, it meant a lot to me to hear from from everybody out there. Um, and, you know, I like to stay consistent, um, had to take some time off, but but I I knew everybody understood. So without further ado, uh, we'll get to the episode. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, I did. I had a lot of fun, a lot of fun doing it. So without further ado, here we go. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in to the Sports Card Therapist and Sports Card Lessons collab podcast episode. I'm Rob. That's Ken. Hope you guys are doing well. Ken, how are you doing, my friend? I am doing well. Glad to be back on the microphone. Uh, it's been a it's been a couple of weeks since I've been on, so happy to get back and happy to uh, be doing this collab episode with you. Yeah, absolutely, man. And uh, you know, I think it's been about two weeks since you last dropped an episode. It's been about one week since I've last dropped an episode. Um, but yeah, I mean, two weeks for you to go without an episode. I mean, I, I I definitely felt like there was a void there, you know, because you are someone that has been so consistent with dropping episodes. I don't think you've ever taken episodes off. Even when you've gone on vacation, you always, you know, uh, pre-recorded an episode to make sure that you had those, you know, weekly or multi times a week drops. So, um, yeah, man. Yeah, so just being consistent, right? That's that's what I like. I like to be consistent. I like people to know it's going to be there. I apologize um, for not for not dropping any episodes. Uh, you know, most people know I posted uh, on Instagram that we had a death in the family. Uh, so my mom had passed away uh, a little over a week ago. So it was it was a tough time for for me for the family. Um, you know, the family's from Canada, so we were, you know, getting people you know, giving people time to travel, to get here for a funeral, things like that. So uh, it was nice to be able to spend time with family. Unfortunately, it was, you know, not for not for a great reason, but uh, definitely took some time off and really from the hobby too, you know. So, so you know, my mom had been sick, you know this, she'd been sick, you know, for, for you know, about three weeks before she passed. So um, I really kind of stepped away and, and really, you know, concentrated all my time uh, with her and family and, 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 you know, kind of quarterbacking everything. So, um, yeah, it was just, it was, it was, it was one of those days where it was the first day where I probably should have been just taking it easy and relaxing, but we got together, right. We, we did our thing. We, uh, went and we went and caught a show today and, and, you know, just a lot of talking and, and, and I'm glad it's, I'm glad to be able to do this collab episode breaking back in, jumping back in after, after almost, you know, a month out of the hobby, but two weeks out from podcasting. Yeah. And, you know, I definitely want to say, I'm sorry for your loss. And I'm sure I echo, I echo the voice of most of your listeners for sure. You know, and most people that know you in general in this hobby and it sucks, man. It, it sucks losing, losing a family member and, um, you know, especially someone as as close and as important as as a parent. Yeah. And um, you know, and you and I, you know, we spent the entire time down to the show today, which was about an hour. We spent the entire time just talking, and uh, you know, and you told me, you know, a lot about what the last month has really been like for you, and it was just a sh strange similarity to to what I had when I lost my father ten years ago. You know, just to like it really almost can mirror what you know kind of what the circumstances were just surrounding everything and uh you know just just not easy man and you know you know the, for for a few years there wasn't a day that passed where i did not think of my dad and uh and 
I, I guess, you know, for me, it, it's gotten a bit easier as time has gone on, but still, you know, though, though a week will go by and I'll be like, wow, I haven't thought about my dad in a week. And, and a lot of times things happen in my life. And, and the first thing I think of is, man, I wonder what my dad would say. You know, this is something that I would I would call my dad about, especially when it comes to sports, especially when it comes to the New York Yankees, you know, and, um, you know, just just life in general, you mm -hmm. know, and um, but, you know, different circumstances and you, your mom was able to see you just become an incredible man. You know, she was able to have some incredible grandchildren and, um, you know, but still, I, I would imagine it doesn't lessen the pain, especially with it being so fresh. No, no, not at all. And, you know, like I, I kind of took care of my mom, too. I watched over her, you know, everything she needed. I was there for help take care of it. So, yeah, it's it's definitely it's going to be a little different for me, too. You know, and I and I find myself like I'm thinking of the days and certain things I will do. And even during the time of planning a funeral and things like that, I'm just thinking, oh, I should be doing this or call her or whatever. Yeah. So it's definitely going to take some time. It's definitely going to take some time. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know. I know that you, you know, your, your partner has been just incredible and she, she's an amazing person and, you know, yeah. between your children and her children, you know, I know that you have a, you have quite a big, quite a big support network there, you know, yeah. on, on a personal level in home. So that's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Thankful, very thankful for them, for everyone around me. A very good, very good support system, you know, and I couldn't ask for better people around me in my life, you know, and, and, and we talk about this, right. We've talked about this since the, the day we became friends, right. The, the people you surround yourself with are, are as important as anything else. I mean, it says a lot about you and who you are. And, uh, I, I have an incredible support system and, um, probably could not have gotten through as well as I did these last, this last month without my support system. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's, it's one of these things where it's like most of us or wh whether if we're consuming content or, or people are consuming our content or we know people from shows or even from the wolf pack and stuff, right? It's like, we, we know each other through the hobby lens and, and very coincidentally, right before you and I started recording, I saw a post by, uh, you know, Sean victory investments and, and he had, you know, he did a couple story posts today and he was, you know, just showing some of the work that he had done, you know, around his house, around his property. And he took a picture of his daughter next to a bunch of split wood. And he said, my daughter and I splitting wood and not talking about sports cards as much as I love the hobby. It actually takes low precedence in my life comparatively a lot more important things to spend time doing and i could not have said that any any better i mean as much as i love the hobby as much as i love the hobby it's like i, I love the friendships that i've built because of the hobby you know through the hobby like with you even much more than the cardboard itself you know and and when i think about it i think about my family i think about friends i think about my career i think about my responsibilities really the hobby is not number one, number two, or even number three in my life. I love cards. And I think, and I know you do too. And I think the content that we put out absolutely reflects and echoes that. But at the end of the day, it's just a hobby for 99% of us. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent, you know, and, and, and I struggled a little bit too, right. When, when all this was going on, I still put a couple episodes out, you know, because I felt like I wanted to be consistent and I didn't, I wanted to do that, but then it came to a point where I just had to step back. Right. And then I, I put it out there and, and so many people reached out to me. So many people, I was so thankful people reaching out, man, just, you know, sorry for your loss and, and everything else. It was, you know, it was good. It was, I, I knew people understood at that point and 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 a lot of people who who reached out to me it was you know family first and and you know fam just so much about family and 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 it's true and sometimes you know uh when we when when we list things out like you were just saying one two three four the importance of things you know at the end of the day it's still just a hobby but we have all these hobby friends and we have, it's a culture, right? It's our life. It's, it's, and, and even though like you go through stuff and you spend this time with your family, you still have the hobby people, you know, that are here and they're, they're, 
you know, they're, they're here waiting, you know, for you to come back and, and still be part of it, which is really kind of cool. Yeah. And I could remember over the last couple of weeks, first of all, I, I definitely, I think, I'm not going to say I made that conscious decision, but I can remember so many times being like, I think I'm I'm going to reach out to Ken again today. I'm going to reach out to Ken. And I was like, you know, I think I want to kind of give him that space, not saying you can't make that call yourself, you know, but like almost like check out of the hobby kind of thing. You know what I mean? And so, so even though you and I were in pretty regular contact, you know, I could remember saying to you like, you know, knowing what you were going through before your mom passed. And I said, you're going to drop an episode. You don't have to drop an episode. Just don't, you know, don't feel like you got to put out an episode. And you were, and, and I think part of it was like, A, like you said, you want to maintain that consistency. But in a way, sometimes we can just feel so, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, so I'll speak for myself. You know, in my in my personal life, sometimes I can feel so run down or so much pressure from all my personal stuff that the hobby actually is an escape for me which is really what it is right so so i look forward to putting out episodes because i just want to take an hour i want to check out for an hour of my life and you know so i wasn't sure if if, if maybe that's kind of how you were feeling too like no you know i need i need a little bit of balance here but um at the end of the day you know i know i know your listeners missed you um you know dropping content regularly and and i did too because i'm you are on days you drop you are the first show i listen to every single week and i appreciate that yeah and you're absolutely right before we move on and i just want to say yeah you know having having this having this part of the hobby being able to, you're right, at the end of doing a lot of stuff, spending like a whole day at the hospital and things like that, coming home and just being able to come in here and, 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 you know, just talk cards or even pull out cards or, you know, drop a episode in the hobby. I, it was definitely a, a, a nice escape. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, so moving on and, and jumping into cards, um, you know, so, you and I were talking during the week, you know, and you, and you said, listen, like my, you know, I have family up, um, they're all leaving Saturday night and I want to go to the big Stanford show, right? You wanted to go to the big Stanford show, um, here in Connecticut. And I said, absolutely, man, let's do it. So that's what we did, right? You and I, we, we both connected and, and made sure that we were both gonna, gonna head down there. So, in terms of the show today, because I think, you know, the show, we won't spend too much time on the show. I know we want to talk about overall, like where you were at hobby wise, where I'm at hobby wise, where I think it seems like friends of ours are also at. It's kind of like this, you know, kind of like this, you know, downshifting a bit, right? Downshifting a bit in the hobby and, and kind of maybe. I don't know about pumping the brakes, but it seems like there's just not as much going on. So I'm curious if where you feel like that's coming from, because it sounds like you've identified with that as well, right? Like even your personal stuff aside, it feels like things have kind of, you've kind of pumped the brakes a little bit. So tell me a little bit about like where you're at right now and, and why you think you personally have gotten to that point. Yeah, I think, and we talked about this, uh, um, I, I think a lot of what happens this time of year um, is a number of things. One, real football, you know, football season has showed up. So so we get involved in that. A lot of us are involved in fantasy football. Um, it, it, it's the end of summer. You know, people talk about the uh, the national hangover, right? But it's it's the end of summer. You know, we're, we're rolling into the, we're into the fall now, you know, the holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, that's not, not that far away. And I think it's just that stretch in the hobby. And, and I think we've noticed this over the last couple of years that things just kind of slow down in all aspects. Like we will, we'll see it, you know, with people online, we'll see it at shows, we'll see it. And I'm not saying that, you know, the shows are dead or anything like that. I just think that people tend to slow down a little bit this time of year because there's a lot more things going on there there's the same amount of time but now we're filling that time with more things you know around us and, and one of the things i talked to you about right was just content like i consume content from february you know all the way to 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 july right i'm consuming just all 
you know, uh, hobby content. But then coming into August, I start to listen to content with as well, I should say as well, adding on for content with, with fantasy football, right? So I need to start getting my information together before we're getting into drafts and things like that and throughout the season. So now my content is, is doubled. Not only am I listening to hobby stuff and I'm listening to fantasy stuff. And then on the weekend, what are we doing, right? We're watching football all day Sunday. Both of us said, we need to get home. We need to jump on the couch, right? We want to watch some football. We were hurrying home from a show. So. Yeah, and and you know, I th I think I would I would echo that, and I know I've touched on a, a little bit on my show, but I know for me, the lead up to the national is crazy, right? Because the national is only one week, but I think people, I'll speak for myself, I really start gearing up, I start warming up for the national probably once May hits, right? Like so, once May first, you know, you turn the calendar page, boom, it's May. I'm gearing up for for the national and especially this last year with us, you know, having our event there and stuff like that. I think there's a lot that goes into that. Right. And and the build up to that is insane. And I think after that. Right. I, I you know, I come home. I'm definitely still on that high. I'm still on that high. Like, oh, my God, that was incredible. There's so much like, you know, the national recap content to make. And and you can really talk about the national for like a good two to four weeks. I feel like people just really want to consume that stuff. Then that kind of switches right into like you're saying fall. Hmm. Right. Fall. All kids going back to school, um, real NFL fantasy football. And I'd be lying if I said, like, I, I think I look back last year and I think last year, right around September, I kind of I don't want to take, say took a step back, but I could feel myself downshifting a bit, you know, just kind of slowing down the engine a little bit. And whether if it's the national hangover, because I don't consume uh fantasy content like you're saying. I know you were telling me earlier today how how you actually use up a lot of your content consumption time actually just listening to fantasy talk because you take fantasy so seriously. There's a lot of people out there that do that as well. And as we know, there's only so many hours in the day. We only have so many hours to consume content. So I think all of that kind of plays a role, not to mention the holidays coming up, not to mention people starting to look forward to the money they're spending on Halloween costumes the money they're spending on black friday and thanksgiving the money they're spending on christmas and new years and i think after the holidays so I, for me i do feel like there's this three to four month lull l-u-l-l -L, lull right in in the hobby and um i could be wrong and i've had people really get upset with me before because last year i called this out too right around this time and i've had show promoters like get pissed off at me for saying it i've had uh card shop owners say it i've had flippers say it and you know kind of be like you know i don't know what you're talking about the hobby's alive and well kind of thing and i'm like I'm kind of calling it how I see it. I'm not saying it's the truth. It's my truth, though. This is how I see it. This is how I feel. This is how I'm participating. And you got to figure if if we if we have our engines rev 12 months out of the year, that's really what happens. You know, with burn. You know, you could really burn out from that. So I think it makes sense to take your foot off the gas a little bit, at least in my experience. Yeah, and and you know, people can get on you, but it you know how you're saying it. And 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 how I'm hearing what you're saying too, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. Is not that that oh you know the hobby is slowing down or anything like that. It's just that people have more things to do, right? I mean, there's just this time of year. There's just a lot to do, you know. Between you know when the kids go back to school, when September hits, and the end of the year, there's so much going on with sports. There's going so much going on with with holidays and things like that. And I know. You know, when we started setting up three three years ago now, I mean, yeah. I, I think those those the December shows were the ones that were like crazy shows, like absolutely crazy shows. Um, it was October, you know, late October, uh, November and December. Th those shows were crazy. And then they would slow down and pick back up and slow down like throughout the year. It kind of kind of, you know, goes up and down just depending on how many people. Like, you know, are, are you know, 
participating and going out to all these things. But when we so show up to the shows, I mean, we have people there. It's not like there's nobody there. You, you the shows are. I think the shows are well traveled. I don't know. Like I didn't set up this weekend, so I don't. I I couldn't say like sales were great or sales were not not great. But you know, I I think that for the most part, you know, the shows are as well as well traveled as they could be around here. Yeah. And so, so talking about shows and we can get into a little bit about today's show that we went to. So we went to, um, it was Stanford, Connecticut. It was a new show. Um, I forget the exact name, exactly what they were calling the show. Um, the Northeast, Northeast sports card convention, maybe something like that. So yeah, yeah if you just Google Stanford, Stanford with an M, not an N, um, so we go there and we get there an hour after the doors open doors open at nine we get there right around 10 right we walk in at 10. um a lot of tables i think there were supposed to be 300 tables there so 300 tables is a pretty big size show right and it, this is a big massive hotel so the entire lobby area conference rooms you know just i mean there's tables everywhere and when i say that the show at 10 o'clock, an hour after the doors open, were dead. I feel like the show was absolutely dead when we got there. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the first thing I said to you. First thing I commented, I said, there is no one here. Yep. And how much were tables? Were they 300? 350. 350 for a two for two days. 350 for two days. And listen, what I want to say is this, okay? I I end up pissing off a lot of, I don't want to say a lot, but I've pissed off my share of um, show promoters over the years by talking about the way that I see shows. And, and what I'll say is I never want to talk negatively about a show experience. Cause I actually had an, a phenomenal show experience today as we'll talk, but, but, I, I have to keep it real. I don't ever want to come on and talk about how slow a show was because with that, to me, a show's uh, a show's walking traffic and, and the success of a show, I think, is a really, or the failure of a show, is a good indication of the market, mm -hmm. right? So, so in, in a good indication of the market, then that transfers over to content, right? So, like, I want... I want to have really good content with a lot of action and I want to be able to report that everything's phenomenal. Um, and, and I want to have more people at shows. I want to have more people in the hobby. I want to have more people consuming content, like all of that stuff. So I hope that I don't say anything that will truly upset random show promoters. But when we got there, the show was dead. Yeah. There was no one there. Yeah. I mean, for 300 tables, there was maybe, I don't know, from what I saw, maybe 50 to 75 people there. And that means there were more dealers than people. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And we see that a lot, you know, uh, especially on Sundays. But it, it, I, And it I, was the Sunday show. You're right. It was a I, Sunday I, show. I don't know why. And I know it's destination and things like that. I don't know why people push to, spend, to charge you more money on tables and then have Sunday shows when nobody wants it. everyone i know is like they buy a table and then they're like anybody want to buy my sunday table because nobody wants to go back on sunday you know it would be easier just to say let's just do it on saturday and and, and call it a day right and like everybody's happy they go there for one day everybody comes in i mean i talk you know i i, I know a lot of the dealers i'm always setting up I've talked, oh yeah talk to a ton of dealers today. it's gotten to the point you know more dealers than me <laughs> you know more dealers than me yeah and I asked them, like, they tell me the truth. How's the show? And they and they tell me, look, yesterday, I mean, it started out slow. Yesterday being Saturday, it started out slow. You know, there was probably a three or four period, three or four hour window in the afternoon that I got really busy. And if you made sales in that window, you, you know, you had a great day. You could, you'll, you'll say yesterday was a positive day because there were a number of people that I, that said, you know, it got busy yesterday, but I didn't have any sales. So this has just been horrific for me. No sales yesterday or today where some people said, you know, I made all my money in three or four hours yesterday and I was happy to do it. Um, but we know today that, you know, people were packing up early. I mean, we, we, we left 
at, at 12 30 and people were already packing packing up and leaving then um there was um there there probably wasn't i mean i didn't see any big sales i i want to say that i going there i knew a card that i wanted to buy was there and well and, i i had a big sale so i, yep. I don't and and I don't want to cut you off guys. I want you to finish, but I don't want to say we, we have no idea if there were big sales or not. I, I mean, you might have a better idea. I know that I talked to, I probably in passing talked to 25 dealers and just been like, Hey, how's the weekend for you? Cause I want to know, right. I know I'm going to be going and doing a podcast. I want to know there wasn't a single dealer out of 25 that I talked to. And I'm, I'm guessing on the number 25 could be a couple more, could be a couple less. There wasn't a single dealer that said, I had a great show. Every single one of them gave me the look of dread. <laughs> and like you said, I don't think it had anything to do with football being on today. We saw dealers packing up at 11 a.m. when the doors opened at 9. Yeah. 11 a.m. Yeah. 11 noon. There wasn't a single dealer that was like, this was a great show. Mm. And it could be because it was a new show. That could be part of it. And and I did hear I didn't hear a three to four hour span that was awesome yesterday. I heard there was a there was a, a a nice there was a nice window where you know it was decent. Yeah. But even still, you know I I didn't talk to a single dealer that was like, oh, I would do it again in a heartbeat. Yeah, good yeah. show. Yeah. And I think a lot of people felt too, and this is this is what I heard. Uh, you know, we just did East Coast National uh, at the Westchester uh county center right we just did that in august which wasn't that far away from where this was right here and i think I'll, and that was very busy and and i think a lot of people felt that this being that close that it was going to draw the same type of attention there so a lot of the dealers were very excited bought into the tables got down there and i just don't think it had the draw what from what we saw i don't think it had the draw of what the draw was to the, to that East coast national show back in August. And one of the dealers commented to us too. They said, listen, it's no fault to the promoter. Cause the promoter has been, but right. You were standing right there. We we're, he said, the promoter has been busting his ass. Yep. 100%. Um, trying to, trying to do this thing. And, and I, that's when I commented to you, cause you and I have talked multiple times about like, ah, should we do a show? Should we try to do a show? Should we put a throw <laughs> our hat in the ring kind of thing? And, and, I just said to you, I said, this is why we should not do a show because yeah. I would feel terrible and powerless. Yeah. You know, that feeling like when your kids are sick and you just, you will do anything you can to take that pain away. Just like this, the ultimate feeling of powerlessness. Yeah. I would, I, I could imagine that for a show promoter to put everything you can into trying to build up a big show, 300 tables, 300 tables. Yeah. And for it to look like the way it did today, I, we weren't there on Saturday, but we heard it wasn't great on Saturday. Well, if it wasn't great on Saturday, then I don't even want to know because today, very slow, very yeah. slow. Now, um, and one yeah. of the downfalls, too, is and I'm just going to throw out there before you can keep going um, is, you know, a lot of these guys like for me, I, if I'm going to drive down there, I'm going to stay overnight. Right. So. If it's a two day show when, you know, Saturday, Sunday and you stay overnight, that's added expenses onto a show, too, that, you know, you really hope that it's really worth, you know, that show and Sunday is going to be worth it to, you know, cover a lot of those hotel and meals and and, th and those expenses, too. So those are things that I talk about setting up all the time, not even just this show, any show is when you're buying into a two day show, you really need to hope that you're covering you know, those expenses too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one thing I'll say is, so I'm, I'm, I'm making my rounds, right? So you and I stayed together for probably the first, probably like the first, what, 75 tables, maybe hundred yeah. tables, probably yeah. like the first third, right? Mm -hmm. You and I stayed together and, and that's hard to do when you're walking a show with someone, because <laughs> you and I, we buy, sell and collect totally different stuff. I yeah. mean, we don't have one similar card in our cases, right? So so what draws your attention isn't going to draw mine. What draws my attention, you're probably going to keep walking past. So eventually, you and I just end up splitting off. And as I'm walking, um, I 
stop and see this. I see this kid, never seen him before. I say kid, he's probably like 25, 30 years old. And I look in his case, he doesn't have a ton in his case, but he's got some decent stuff. I see his Babe Ruth cut auto. And I'm like, wow, that's unbelievable. He was asking 8,500 for it. And I'm like, okay, that, that, that makes sense. Okay. That's a beautiful cut auto. Can't afford that. I look over and I see this Wilt Chamberlain cut auto as well psa psa graded and everything like that i ask him for his price he tells me his price so i'm just sitting there thinking i and and i'm i'm not as used to being on this side of the table you know i realize that when i am walking a show really the cards are in the other person's hands right they kind of have and and i get that and i have no problem doing i have no problem with not getting a phenomenal deal because i know you know, they, they drove here, they took the expenses, uh, $300. They might've stayed overnight. I know there's a lot of expenses that go into setting up, you know? And so he gives me his price and I'm like, I I was just going to walk away. And I said, are you in, I, there was a kid right next to me and he asked him, Hey, are you interested in trades? And the kid goes, yeah, I'm interested in trades. And he's like, nah, I'm all set with that, but thank you. So I go, Okay, he's interested in trades. I go, would you be open to some trades? He's like, sure. He looks at my box. He's like, wow, you got some good stuff, blah, blah, blah. Took out a couple cards there. He grabbed two cards of mine that have been, I guess you can say stale, right? Like they're cards I've owned for well over a year. I feel no emotional attachment to them. They're great cards. They were both flawless patches, flawless patches, both game used. Uh, One was an auto. One was just a flawless patch. And He's like, how about these two cards plus $50 on top for the Will Chamberlain? I said, deal. So I ended up walking away with this Will Chamberlain cut auto PSA authenticated. It looks like it said, it looks like he wrote peace and then Will Chamberlain. Yeah. So, and this cool. is an oversized slab. So this slab is like something that would fit like probably like a five by seven card in here maybe or or four by six actually this is a four by six size so it's a pretty big cut and then as i'm about to walk away he's he's like complimenting my cards i'm complimenting his and i'm like oh what do you got on 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 that cut signature and he's like oh i got this and i'm like huh i go okay well would you be interested in trading for that too he's like yeah let me see what let me open up your case again so i ended up making another deal and got this muhammad ali cut auto now look how this is the same size slab, same <laughs> size slab, but look at the difference in signatures. Yeah. So Muhammad Ali right there. So I got both PSA um, authenticated and slab Muhammad Ali and Will Chamberlain. I am feeling really good about these. I, I, I was like, whew, I did not have that on my bingo card today. Yeah. Showing up at the show and getting a Will Chamberlain and Muhammad Ali cut auto that is one of the best things about this hobby when you go show up to a show and you're like uh even when you're leaving you're like oh should i put this in should i take this should i not take that should i bring something with me and and you kind of go you show up to a show and all of a sudden you get some unbelievable like this it's a cut auto or something you're really looking for pops up and then the whole way home you're like man i'm glad i went there today you know like who would have ever thought that was going to happen today? You know? And you know what? I, I I don't think I would have gone to this show if it wasn't for you, mm-hmm. right? I'm still going to shows. I'm still a regular. I'm, I'm, But here's the thing. Like, this is where the participation is required really comes into play because this was a show I wasn't planning on going to. And I had talked uh, last month on an episode about a show I wasn't planning on going to. And at that show... As I'm talking, I'm, I'm also reaching at that show. I ended up walking in and randomly picking up, picking up this 1930s Babe Ruth, Babe Ruth type one photo. So you never know what you're going to get by going to a show. So when I say participation is required, this is a lesson that I'm continuing to learn on a, on a daily basis in this hobby. It's continuing to be reinforced to me. Well, I, I know, too, going to some of these shows now, I'm very specific, right, about what I collect. And, uh, like, people will call me all the time, you know, like, or send me pictures of, you know, Trinity Rodman stuff. And and even even when I'm at a show, like a show like today, I get a guy who will call me who is in one row behind me being like, 
this guy's got women's soccer here. <laughs> you need to get over here quick. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's, it, you know, it's a, you're out finding it. You have to dig around me. I, I, it's like, I've got all my people out there, you know, I got all these eyes, you know, everywhere looking and, and the card I picked up today. Um, I knew this card was in Portland. Uh, the same promoter did a show, this show in Portland back in September. And uh, somebody at that I know sent me a picture from there saying, Hey, he's got this card. You know, I said, well, give him my information, tell him to contact me. And we'll, you know, I can do, you know, do a deal online with him. And he never did contact me. And the person I knew said, I, I messaged him and said, is he going to, is he going to be at the show this weekend? And he said, yeah, he's going to be there. And I said, good. So going there, I knew there was a good chance this card was still available and there. Um, and you know, this is a pop two card, but it's a Trinity Rodman. It's, the very first relic cards that she had, and this was a PSA 10, and these are numbered, this one's numbered 79 to 100, but these are numbered to 100. But this is, wow, I don't know if you can see that, but this is just, yeah, just an unbelievable card to get. If you look behind me, I have a similar one, which is numbered to 10 with, with right there. With a, with a better patch on it. But, I mean, this is PSA 10. You know how hard it is to get these things to, oh, yeah. to gem? So when I knew it was there uh, and I went and I I was trying to play it cool and somebody else I know was calling me from two tables away saying, you got to come check out this Rodman. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, Shh, okay, shush. I, I want to go make a deal for it. Don't I don't want to seem too eager. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, I was I was happy. I think we both went yeah. home. No, we it's awesome. Today. Yeah, and and I think to talk about the importance of relationships in the hobby, right? So I'm walking around, and you know, we we bump into our buddy Laz, right? Laz and Tyler uh, from New Jersey. Laz is one of the best show promoters on the East Coast, and he also has his store. Uh, pop century collectibles uh we hosted a trade night there right so so i go up to their table and you know we're just kind of joking around talking catching up you know because these are these are guys we've we've gotten to know now for a few years and when we see them it's like you know it's like you, you give them a you give them a handshake but you, you pull each other and give them a hug too it's like dude what's up you kind of embrace for a second how you doing man so i'm standing there and you know we're just kind of talking and and one of them says, Rob, listen, sell me some stuff, man. I, I want to buy. I want to buy. Sell me some stuff. And I'm like, all right. Well, yeah, if you guys, if you, yeah, let me see. So I open and let me just say yeah, this. I, say no to that. <laughs> I know. Right. And let me say this. And and if I didn't have a relationship with them, they probably wouldn't have just been blunt like that and come right out and said that. And I, I wouldn't have stood there talking with them either. I would have just walked by, glanced in their case and kept walking. So. I wasn't even planning on bringing any cards today. I wasn't planning on bringing anything. So none of these things I acquired, I likely would have gotten, I would have paid cash for, right? I would have just kind of kept walking. These deals kind of happened. I think that's why when I go to a, when I go to a show, when I go anywhere, um, you know, you want to bring your stuff with you. You want to bring your cards with you. But the thing is too, is like, sometimes you can, sometimes I can get in my head about, about my collection or, or my cards that I want to move. Sometimes, you know, I can feel like insecure. You know, and and I know you and I have had this conversation, like when we when we hosted uh, the trade night up in New Jersey over the summer before the national. Um, you know, you had all the hottest NFL RPAs, uh, so select XRCs, all this stuff, and and everyone's coming over to your case, and you know, people like see my vintage or like my really rare and scarce like stuff that like you just don't see every day, and people flip through a couple cards and be like, eh. How you doing, Rob? Love the show. And then they just keep walking, you know, and I'm like, man, like, you know, you, you kind of almost feel like you're being rejected. So so mm -hmm. part of me was like, I don't know if I want to bring my cards today. I don't know if I want to bring my stuff because it's like, you know, in a way, like, I almost feel like I'm like pimping myself out by like, OK, here, let me open up my case. Let me show you what I have. And and I feel like I'm leaving myself open for judgment. Like if my cards don't measure up to what the dealer thinks. <laughs> <laughs> like, you, you know what I mean? Like, this is me being vulnerable saying this, but it, it, it's true. And I, I can't be the only one that feels that way. Right. So, so I open up my case, you know, to Laz and Tyler and they start flipping through and they're like, oh, okay, okay. We like this. We like this. And before you know it, I mean, very like there was no, 
there was no negotiating. There was no like reading each other. Like, ah, should I go high? Should he go low? Like, you know, kind of thing. It was like, and, and, and Laz and Tyler even commented, like, this is why it's so nice to just do deals with, with people that, you know, it's like, we, we weren't trying to hit each other over the head with it. We figured out a, a negotiating system very quickly. Like at first he's like, what number do you have on this? And in my head at first I was, I was telling him what the most recent comp was, but in his head, he was listening for what number could you give this to me for? So after about two or three minutes of talking, we're like, okay, hold on. So when you're asking me the number, do you want to know what my lowest number is or what the most recent comp is? So then we can negotiate. He's like, no, just tell me your number. So we just kind of started doing it like that. And before you know it, boom, boom, boom. He's got a stack of my cards and I have 6,500 cash. <laughs> like I wasn't even planning on going there and selling anything, yeah. but I go there. And before you know it, I have a bunch of cash in my hand and I'm like, okay, this is cool because a part of me is like, you know, part of me is like, I will, I, I loved those cards. There's a reason why I bought those cards. I don't buy cards to flip anymore. I buy cards because they do something to me. I buy cards because I feel like they look really good in my collection. However, with certain cards and there were certain cards where he's like, listen, this is what I could do this on. I'm like, no, I'm all, I, I'll keep that. You know, I'm going to keep that. I think I'm going to keep that kind of thing. And then some, I'm like, that's not available. That's not available kind of thing. Um, but I, I, there's something about being liquid and and being i don't want to say cash heavy because i hate when people post that on on like instagram or twitter cash heavy buying what what is it what do they say buying, buying strong buying strong like like i don't want to i don't want to be that guy that's like i'm cash heavy but but there's something to be said for being liquid and, and you and i were talking on the way home and you were saying that you're extremely liquid right now because you don't have that many cards as far as inventory because you never really re-upped you never bought much after the national right so you sold a lot of your stuff in national so you're sitting on like a pile of cash right now just wondering what your next move is going to be yeah well that i mean i didn't re-up in football but i re-upped i re-upped with hockey you know i probably have a case full of hockey right now that i've just been buying you know since you know uh, you know late july august september just buying hockey, waiting for that season to start. Uh, I'm doing a show in November, so I'm sure I'm going to put that case full of hockey out there. But I never really went back and and bought bought you know replenished football. Um, that I just kind of waited to see what would happen uh, with the football. And it, interestingly enough, I like I showed up today. I, I was going through. I told you I was going through like stuff to put in, and I ended up bringing a small case with me because I really don't have that much inventory. Um, to put out there. So I was hoping like I was going to go do some shopping today type of thing. Um, but I brought like four, you know, what did I have? Like 10, 11 football cards, right? So I had, I had four, you know, graded cards off each one under a hundred dollars. I had a couple, maybe in the three, $400 range Then I have four higher end 2000, you know, 3000, 3,500, like that type of thing. And it's interesting, you know, we just talked about that word buying strong, you know, people, you know, people are saying, ah, we're buying strong, but then, you know, you pull out a couple of times, I pulled out some higher end cards, like a Josh Allen RPA and stuff. And, you know, ah, that's too much. <laughs> you know, that, you know, that, 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 that can't, can't jump into that right now. I don't want to, you know, I had a couple of my homes cards. Oh, those are beautiful. But yeah. Yeah. And, and we had a conversation about this. It's like, it, it, it's very funny that there's certain price points on certain players and on certain cards, no matter if people say they're buying strong, are they buying these types of cards? Are they not? Because we, I, I could sit here and I've, I've gotten a lot of flack, a lot of comments coming back on mine when I'm talking about certain cards. People are like, well, I would buy those cards if the price was this or the price was that. And I 100% believe them. But when you go to a show like this and there's 300 tables and you're going around and people are very standoffish about buying any higher end. I say higher end. They're not higher end. What are they? Mid end. They're, you know, a couple of 2000, 2500, 2800 dollars. Like cards like that, people are very standoffish from buying or they'll make they'll say, you know, I'm buying strong. But, you know, I if this car is 2500 man probably the best i could do is 1800 or 1700 you know something like that so it, it it's an interesting um 
it's interesting when you show up to some of these shows and you've got a guy like Laz, right? And you just mentioned Laz. And Laz, I know because I've dealt with Laz. Laz is a guy who says I pay strong and he will pay strong. And he's there, he knows exactly what cards he wants. He's not just buying any card that shows up at his table. There's specific cards that he that that fall within a category for him. And I think there's a lot of people like that. But then I think there's a lot of people that are, you know, people like myself, right? That are very judgmental, very picky. I may buy this one, but I don't want that one. I may buy this or I may not buy that. And I'm not sure if um people everyone that's buying at a show is really prepared to buy at a show. Yeah. And I have so much to say there, man. Um, so the whole conversation that you and I had on the ride home, right? So a guy, a guy says to you, he over uh, another dealer overheard you talking about a Josh Allen RPA that you have, right? It, it's a lower one, right? It's, it's like sticker auto. It's not a high end brand, but still it's like a 25, $3,000 card, right? 2,500, 3k. And he's like, Oh, I'd be interested in that. He said to you, and he said, I don't care how much it is. As long as there's, I can make money off it. Right. Yeah. Stop by my table. So you go over there and, and you pull it out and he goes, um, I'm not really looking to spend that much. And it was like, and you're kind of like, what is going on? And, and I, so what happened to me today, I don't, I can count on one hand, the amount of times I've ever gotten rude or taken a tone with someone on the show for many reasons. One, I try not to let any kind of interaction and I try not to, you know, I never want to be that guy that's a jerk because I could be wrong too, right? I could, and I don't want to look back and be like, ah, oh, you were the wrong there. Um, you know, also having the show, having the podcast, like I don't want to be a jerk, like in public, right? So we get to the show and this is where we actually end up splitting off because the guy goes, oh, what do you got? One of the dealers, oh, what do you got? And I, I said, why are you buying? And he's like, yeah, I said, I have some vintage, you know, I have some pretty unique stuff. He's like, I'd love to see what you have. So I open up my case. He starts going through my stuff. Now, everyone that's set up around him. So other dealers are all now starting to like circle over. Everyone's kind of starting to dig through my cards, which is kind of uncomfortable. It's kind of like, you know, it's, it's a little uncomfortable, but I could have said something and I'm not complaining about that. I could have been like, whoa, whoa, guys, just one at a time. Like I could have said that, but I didn't. But so now this guy that was like, yeah, I'm buying, you know, let me see what you got. Now he's making stacks. He's taken out. I have a four row huge zion case he took out every single card now he's making like eight piles here right now he's still dealing with customers but when i say dealing with customers i mean like he's selling a 20 dollar card here he's selling a 30 dollar card there's really just like two customers but he's really taking his time and in my head i'm like okay i know i'm not special here i'm not saying that i deserve his full attention he should just ignore his customers however he's pulling out he pulled out four cards of mine that totaled about 20K, 20K, okay? Then he pulled out another four cards of mine that were like $30 cards. So there's about eight cards in total. Four of them total 20K, four of them total 100 bucks. So, okay, so he's got eight cards. So he's like, okay, just just wait, what, give me one sec, he says to me, holds up one finger. Give me one sec, I want to sit, you know, I, I got to deal with my customers too, but don't hang out, so... At this point, I'm there about 30, 40 minutes waiting for this guy. 30 or 40 minutes. Now, he's slowly asking, like, okay, what number do you have on this? What number do you have on that? And I'm telling him, like, hey, the last comp was this. This is where I want to be at, blah, blah, blah. He's like, okay, okay, that all sounds good. Okay. Now, 30, 40 minutes has gone by. And he's like, okay, now let's 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 do this. Okay. So he pulls out his notepad. He pulls out his pen. And he pulls out this one of the 25 or 30 dollar cards of mine it's a john elway rookie it's a psa 7 last comp was 30 bucks i think i had 55 price tag on it but i mean that's just what i would put it in as the case and and who knows maybe the comp before that was 45 but this last one was 30 so he's like oh well this is you know last comp on this was 30 i'm like okay well i mean i could be at that comp you know i could do that He's like, well, I can't be at, you know, I can't do that comp, you know, because you have to understand when you're sitting on this side of the, I, I said, listen, I get it. Totally get it. Like, we'll make it work. Don't worry about it. So then he starts looking at the second $30 card and he's like, oh, he starts looking at comps. So this is about 45 minutes now. And I go, listen, 
and in my head i'm like i'm like i'm about to walk away from this so i'm, I'm just gonna put it out straight to my go listen what are we doing here i said you have about 20k in my high-end cards right there i could give a crap less about those four cards you're looking at right now i don't know can you tell me why you're starting with the 30 dollar cards because those i don't care i'll throw those in for free if we make a deal on these bigger cards, I, I said this to him. I go, I don't know what we're doing here. He's like, whoa, you know, I'm just trying. I, I'm like, listen, if you want to work on something, let's start talking some numbers. So we at least know he's like, well, I'm not trying to waste your time. I, I take a deep breath. I'm like, listen, I, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what your plan is, but He's like, well, I, I, you know, I'm not trying to take your time here, you know, because I know you probably want to go walk the room too, but, but I am maybe interested in this. So I tell that story to say this, cause I probably wouldn't have even told the story. I said, you know what? I was very respectful. I said, I'm going to take my cards. I'm going to walk away. I appreciate your time. Thank you. I spent 40 minutes there as this guy just dilly dallied like, and all he was trying to do was tell me about how he's been doing this for years, how he's did this, how he's in that. And I'm like, I wouldn't have told this story, but when you started talking about the guy that was like, oh, I'll buy anything. I'll Josh Allen RPA. I'll buy anything as long as there's enough, if it financially makes sense for me. And then you pulled it out and he's like, oh, it's a little too much for me. Like that was a lower end Josh Allen RPA you have. No offense to you or that card. So <laughs> I feel like, I feel like it's not only customers. It's not only people that walk shows that like the window shop. I truly feel like there are dealers that like to window shop. There are dealers that, I've set up more than enough times to know that if someone walked in with a $10,000 card and Tyler Laz's partner said this to me once, who he said this exact quote to me, he said, if someone walked in right now with a $10,000 card and he looked around the room, there's at least a hundred dealers in the room. He goes, how many dealers right now do you think would actually be able to buy that card? He said, what? 5%, 5% of the people in here could buy that card. So that's always stuck with me that most dealers, I think, go to a show, maybe 500, maybe a thousand tops in their pocket. If that some dealers go there with nothing, mm -hmm. some dealers go there and they're like, I better sell some cards today. Yeah. And I think that some dealers like the window shop. I think it gives some dealers a feeling of power sitting on that side of the table. And it's almost like in their head, they're like that. <laughs> I, I'm, there's no way I'm buying that card. I don't have that money to buy that card, but you know what? I like looking at these cards and I like this guy. I like this customer thinking I'm interested in those cards. So I'm going to sit here and waste his time. Mm -hmm. I think that some dealers do get off on that. And that was really the vibe I was getting from this guy because a half hour later, I'm sitting there talking with Laz and his guy, Tyler within five minutes, they're, buying $6,500 in cards for me, neither him nor I broke a sweat. It yeah. was very casual. Hmm. It was very, so it's like, I think within like 30 to 60 seconds, you, you can kind of tell if someone's serious or not. And I did not go with my gut. I was trying to be nice. And of course I wanted to, I wanted to see what the guy had to offer for sure. Like, I'm not going to sit here and say, I was just trying to be nice to the guy. Like I was like, Hey, if this guy's interested in some stuff, I would like to move some stuff today. But I think that dealers are just as guilty of window shopping as customers. Yeah. And, and you know what? Here's the thing. Anyone can be a dealer, right? All you have to do is buy the table and now you're a dealer at a show. So, you know, there's, you go and you go like myself, you go to a setup at enough of these shows and you see, you know, certain people who were there, you know, peddling certain things and other people who really want to try to buy and sell. And, you know, there's a lot of people there that just want to buy. There's a lot of people there that just bring stuff to sell. Um, and I and I think we have an expectation. All the time, and maybe we maybe it's because of you know, we look inward of that and get that expectation because when we set up, you know, we're expecting that people are going to show up, you know, with cash in their pocket and want to buy and want to sell and want to make deals and do all this stuff. But, you know, those expectations we set may be a little high because at the end of the day, you don't need a license. You don't, you don't need a diploma. There's, there's nothing you need to become a dealer, right? Anyone, all you have to do is pay for the table and, show up and now you're a dealer. So, um, 
I, I, I think a lot of people have different ideas of what it's what it means, what it means to be a dealer at a at a card show. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Orlando, we got a bunch of people in the comments. Uh, Orlando just asked, um, uh, great job, Rob, on on the transaction. What big cards did you move? So there was a, a, a big Mickey Mantle I moved, a big Bill Russell, um, a Whitey Ford, an Al Kaline, a Eric Dickerson um, rookie auto, a, um, a Anthony Munoz uh, rookie auto, two Hulk Hogan rookie autos, and uh, the star michael jordan rookie i had a 96 tops reprint of that so it was a psa in a psa slab psa 8 but it was when they re-released like 10 10 12 years later that card so i had that so and you know i just gave him a nice package deal on him because because laz is awesome and you know he's when someone comes with cash that's usually you know kind of what happens but um mm -hmm. but yeah man so we're at 55 minutes right now so you know, as we start to wrap up, man, I mean, I feel like we could have talked for like another hour. Maybe we should do part two on Thursday or something. <laughs> hey, I'm all in for it. Right. I want to do uh, a part two. Yeah. So, um, so any final thoughts, any, on, on anything that we discussed? Um, no, I mean, it's just, it was, like I said, it was nice to get back in. It was nice to hit a show. Um, and, and we have, you know, coming up and, uh, there's a lot of shows coming up. There's a lot of shows, a lot of October and November shows coming up. So it's going to be interesting to see, you know, if, if this pattern continues, which shows are, are, are bigger than others. I know, you know, we talked about uh, a number of times this November weekend that has three big shows yeah. going on and, and, you know, we, really the only, the only people it hurts is, is are the dealers right because now you're telling you're you're making people decide which which shows they want to go to so you know hopefully we can correct some of that you know moving forward or in the future that we can you know kind of kind of drive everybody to, from one show to another and not force them to make decisions on shows because that was something people were really mentioning today. They, you know, they're mentioning to me too. Like, you know, they're, they're asking me, when's your next show? What's the next show you're doing? Um, and, and I'm doing, uh, I have some weekend travel plans, so I, I won't be doing anything. I won't be setting up now as, as we speak right now, as it's recording until, uh, November till the Gillette stadium show will be the next show I'll be setting up at. Ooh, that's going to be a big show. Yeah. It's going to be a big show. That's card vault, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. So shout out to Chris Costa card vault. Um, you know, I would love to touch base with you maybe on our next collab episode on, uh, uh, you know, I saw that Card Vault had Jason Tatum at their store. Jason Tatum was there probably signing autographs, I think doing trades and stuff. Fanatics had an event where Tom Brady, Kevin Hart, Travis Scott, and a bunch of other people were at. Um, so I am kind of curious what, you know, maybe some of the commercialization of the hobby does just in general. I'm curious what that does because more people isn't always a good thing. Yeah, You know, and I yeah. think uh, there's a lot of people out there that are doing some good work with uh, they've been holding fanatics accountable and it seems or they've been holding Panini accountable. And it seems like they're they're, you know, going to be right up the keister of fanatics as well as far as quality control and everything else. So I think we're going to have some good uh, some good talking points moving forward, my man. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So thank you guys for tuning in. Rob, sports card therapist, Ken, sports card lessons. Don't forget, take care of yourselves and your collection. And until next time, be good to yourselves and everyone around you. Take care, Rob. All right, Ken. Thanks, man.